gentlemen, thank you very much for having me today. Um, a bit intimidating to be in front of such a distinguished crowd. Well, by the way, <laughs> sorry. Uh, you know, quite a few of uh, my seniors are here, uh, and many of you uh, are so successful in what you do. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll try my best not to let you down uh, this, uh, this session. I think uh, what I can share uh, today uh, is a couple of things. Um, I think you know, when uh, when we think about trade, right, and I'll zero in on one specific aspect of my job, which is free trade agreements, right, FTAs. You know, free trade agreements like TPP, Transatlantic Partnership or say, you know, we now prioritize as our top priority uh, doing uh, an FTA with the European Union. You know, these, these things take at least two, probably more like three, four, or five years to negotiate, right? And then once, once they're negotiated, they get ratified, right? Uh, by respective parliaments, that takes like another year or two. And then once, once they're in effect, they're in effect for the next 20 years. Right? So, when, when we think about free trade agreements or how we want to position ourselves in TPP or with the European Union and so on, you know, you really have to be very forward-looking. Uh, so I, I like to joke that in my job, I'm forced to be a part-time futurologist. Right? I have to think about the world, not as it is today, but as it is likely to be seven years from now, nine years from now, 12 years from now. Why? Because we can't be negotiating an FTA for today. Now, by the time we finish negotiating, by the time we finish ratifying, today is already seven years in the past, right? We've been negotiating an FTA for a past that no longer exists. So, uh, and uh, so now when I uh, talk to the public, right, uh, about these FTAs, uh, I, 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 I like to invite everyone to do a mental experiment. In a mental experiment. Imagine that you fall asleep today and you don't wake up for 15 years. And then, and then say you wake up. What, what do you think the world will look like then? Now, as a, as a guideline, right? Uh, imagine that you fell asleep 15 years ago. So, that, what is that? 2001, 2002. And only woke up today, right? How, how would you feel today? Right, so where, where were we, you know, if you, wanna, if you wanna think back, where were we, where were we in 2001? Where were we in 2002? You know, I guess uh, this grand amnesia didn't exist yet, right? Uh, Samayan city didn't exist yet. Uh, Desert Place didn't exist yet. Maybe the skyline of Jakarta was maybe one third of what it is today. Uh, nobody would have predicted that commodities would be moving, right? That coal mining would become a sexy industry uh, with coal mining companies listing with multi-billion dollar market caps, right? Uh, perhaps people, yeah, you know, palm oil kind of looks interesting, but perhaps nobody would have imagined that it would become as large as it is today. Uh, I think if I remember correctly, the iPhone only came out in 2007, right? So well, I think all of us in this room probably in 2001, 2002, probably we were using either Nokia phones Right? Remember the Nokia communicator? I think I still see a few people there sometimes using it. Or, or Motorola. Motorola phones, right? So, it would have been very difficult to imagine that 15 years later we'd all be walking around with tablets, right? Smartphones. Uh, now, what would the world look like 15 years from now? Right? I think uh, uh, a couple of examples. Uh, I predict that uh, as we drive down Sukarman, you would see the sky pretty full with drones, drone copters. Maybe it would be zipping between buildings, delivering packets, medicines, pizza, martabak, right? There, there might be drone quadcopters that fly between buildings, not even ground floor up and then back to ground floor, but maybe 12th floor to 12th floor, maybe all buildings standardized you know, uh, open the 12th floor for drone landing pads or drone launching pads. 
uh, and there might be drone aircraft that fly a bit higher up. Uh, so we, we have to imagine a world like that, right? Now, uh, I think we, we all know that President Jokowi is incredibly digital savvy, right? incredibly digital savvy. But I think the other thing I can share with you today is, is like this. He's also remarkably savvy in managerial and administrative. Yeah. So I think, uh, obviously, we, we know uh, from his days as the mayor of Seoul, right? he pioneered heavy use of Google Maps to pinpoint where are the spots that are prone to flooding, right? to pinpoint where are the potholes, uh, and so on. And then he pioneered uh, bringing government services online, you know, e-budgeting, e-procurement, e-filing, and so on. Uh, he, he, he ran a very social media intensive uh, uh, campaign, uh, both for Governor of Jakarta uh, and for President, as we all know. Uh, but it's so interesting to me, uh, you know, uh, obviously he also launched a one-stop shop. And uh, it's been remarkable to me to see how many things have been moved from various ministries, including my own, to BKPM. Right? All the ministries have surrendered authorities right, to, to issue certain licenses, permits, uh, solicit or collect data to the BKPM one-stop shop. Uh, now, uh, just this week, we had uh, some cabinet meetings, uh, and yesterday, uh, when Kodarmin, uh, our economics coordinator, minister, uh, released policy package number 11. Uh, give you another example, right? Basically, uh, uh, what's called uh, shared profile. Yeah, the, the technical term that he used for it was uh, share, uh, single risk management. And here's what it means. Uh, so, a company, right, a company, say that imports and exports. They, they have to get, uh, obviously, a tax number from the tax office. Right? They have to get some kind of a company registration number from the Ministry of Law and Human Rights. They have to get a Anka uh, Pangenal Importer, right? Like from, from Trade Ministry. They have to get so many different numbers. Uh, and they get a different number again from uh, the Customs Office, Bechukai, right? Now, interestingly, what's happened over the last 20 years is that all these Ministries, say environmental, labor ministry, you know, you have to you have to register with all these ministries, right? And you get a different ID number from all these different ministries, so you end up with like 17 ID numbers, right? Now, what's happening is uh, policy package number 11 launched a profile sharing program, where essentially, uh, say for argument's sake, that that you collect 17 different ID numbers from 17 different ministries, eventually you'll just need one. Right, we just need one. Uh, and the number we settle on is your NPY pay, your tax number. Right, so once you have an NPY pay, right, you, you're automatically re registered with trade ministry. Uh, so you can import and export using your tax ID. Uh, you no longer have to apply for a separate Anka Pangenal Importer, Anka Pangenal or Importer for after, all this stuff. Uh, you know, if, uh, if for example, uh, we need to check are you are you a bona fide company, right? Trade ministry. Should we should we give you a permit to import? Uh, we can access your profile at the tax tax office. Right. That's that's what's meant by profile sharing and single risk management profile. Right. So, if for example you're already at the tax office, you're already uh, at the labor ministry, uh, and I or we at trade ministry can access your profile and you have a clean profile, right? You have a stellar compliance, you know, then done. You're, you're licensed, right? We, we can significantly cut back on the so-called you know, so due diligence that we have to do on you, right? Same with uh, customs. Say, for example, okay, you're, you're a company, you've been operating for many, many years, but you've gotten to a scale and to uh, a sophistication where now you're starting to import more stuff or you're starting to export more stuff. Uh, and maybe you start importing certain restricted items. Uh, well, for you to pass customs, customs can check your profile, since we are all, since all 17 ministries will be sharing your profile, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and once they see that, that you get high marks from 
Ministry of Labor, Ministry of Trade, Ministry of Industry, then it's like automatic, like you know, no more customs inspection or, or so on. Now, that's all good and nice. I think it will simplify, accelerate, expedite, you know, significantly reduce red tape and, and the efforts you have to go through. But I think what will really become interesting uh, is if you combine it with a second trend. And that is the trend for us in government to be publishing more and more data. Yeah. And I think that's where it will become relevant to technology companies. Yeah. So, uh, I think the example I want to give is uh, the now famous uh, .org, right? Uh, our favorite uh, tech hero, uh, Ayla Najib, uh, who did so much during the election. Uh, but what was what was called Org actually? You know, it was basically a algorithm, a set of algorithms, a website that compiled data that was published to the public by KPP, right, by our election commission. Now, basically, Kaopilu took that data, analyzed it, repatched it in a way that made it user friendly and accessible to everyone, right? So. Uh, I think the, the huge shift, the change in mindset, uh, the uncomfortable thing we're wrestling now uh, is data, right? is information. Uh, and look, I think many of you uh, have seen uh, me in the newspapers, in the media, uh, uh, you know, being put against our agriculture minister, <laughs> like uh, about data pangan. Like who's right, who's wrong? Like you know, whose production numbers can we trust? Uh, you know, one ministry says there's tons of rice. Another ministry says there's not enough rice. Right? Uh, well, I think a couple of things. First of all, uh, as a government puts more and more services online, puts more and more forms online. You know, all the stuff that you have to fill out, uh, all the things you have to report as we put those things online. That's step one. Step two will be publishing the data, right? Basically opening it to the public. Of course, it will have to be aggregated. It will have to be anonymized. We still have to protect the privacy of individual companies, individual persons. But for example, by region, by age group, right? Uh, by time series, then Venture, you know, venture back tech startups can can tackle those databases, those data sets, and turn them into applications, right? Uh, so, I think to give you comfort that look, uh, in order for entrepreneurs to develop useful apps like Kaobu or government has to do our job to collect data, right, diligently and then uh, republish it, make it accessible to the public, to app developers, so they can collect data, right? Health data, agricultural productivity, or agricultural production data, uh, and so on. 